Hey guys, it's Mike here at Weigertz, uh, just doing our, our live uh, demo today on Premna Microphyla, uh, also a tropical Q&A. Um, so we've got Eric and Lindsay, so that's why I'm laughing right now. Um, so we're going to start here in a couple of minutes. I first just want to talk a little bit about the material. Um, for those of you who have followed me for a while, you know that I'm very passionate about Premna. It's one of the species that I work with a lot at home and a lot of the things that I propagate um, and, uh, and I really am passionate about the material. Um, similar to sea hibiscus, water jasmine, and some of our other tropicals that you maybe see me grow. Uh, one of the reasons why we're so excited about this here in Florida um, is that when I first got into bonsai, it wasn't a species that was readily available. Um, it was something that we just kind of read about in books and saw it in uh, pictures of tropical bonsai from Southeast Asia. Uh, so it wasn't until about nine years ago when this became readily available in the States. Um, and so it's rapidly become one of my favorites. Some of its attributes um, are they grow extremely quickly here in the tropics. So you can grow very nice trees in a very short amount of time. Um, they grow very, very fine, small leaves uh, very, very easily. No special technique is necessarily required to kind of uh, uh, dwarf the leaf size literally just routine pruning and maintenance will dwarf them to a, a good degree. Um, and then you can further refine that leaf size even further with advanced techniques and get them smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, they do hold deadwood and in Indonesia, Taiwan, places where they're collected, they are collected with deadwood similar to a, a juniper or a buttonwood. Um, so they will hold deadwood if you're into deadwood designs. Um, and the last thing is the ramification. This is a tree that ramifies and divides branches very, very easily. Um, so for tropical bonsai or any bonsai, that's a, a very desired attribute. So those are the main reasons why I really like this material. Um, so I've been growing them for about eight years now, uh, as well as propagating them in a number of different ways from hair layer, cutting. Um, we've, I've done uh, a lot of cuttings, uh, but that's primarily the way. I don't grow them from seed. They do flower, but it's not a showy flower or one that I would use in bonsai. So we're primarily looking at the foliage, the trunk characteristics, and the ramification. Um, so I have a few examples here that you guys, if we get into some questions, we can pull these aside and talk about some things like refinement, uh, potting, soil mixes, things like that as we get further into the live stream. Um, I also have our large subject here. It's a large uh, Premna that Eric has grown out in the field. Um, how many years do you think that is? So about four years in the ground. So this kind of shows how fast they can grow. Um, four years in the ground and it's got maybe a four inch caliber on it. Um, so very, very quick to grow in the ground. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started and I'll start digging into the tree. Uh, one of the first things I do when I'm starting to design uh, a bonsai is I try to find a, a sufficient front, a front that has good movement, good character, and really bring, brings out the best of the tree. Um, so there is no one front that you can, you can use. This tree can be styled in a number of different ways. And one of the old sayings is you ask six different artists, you'll get 10 different answers. Um, so there is a lot of different ways that we could work this tree. I'm gonna try and keep it pretty straightforward uh, for the live stream, just so we can kind of answer some questions and not get too dramatic. Um, so I'm gonna kind of style this as a, uh, just an informal upright, going over some of the wiring, removing of branches, uh, and just typical design questions, things like that. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do to find okay, the front to know is kind of eliminate sides that cannot be the front. Hey, uh, Mike, can we answer um, oh, sure. Bianca's question? She wants to know what's that animal making the noise? Oh, hey, Bianca. Uh, <laughs> that animal is a peacock. Uh, we have two of them running around the nursery, two male peacocks, and uh, so when they get a little rambunctious, they'll go ahead and let you know it. So you may hear him pipe up uh, throughout the video. He's uh, not too far behind me, just sitting on the rock there, so you might hear him again. Uh, do we have any other questions right there? Um, just that right now. We have about 46 viewers. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hope you guys are staying safe out there. Um, so what I was just talking about was finding the front on the bonsai. Uh, one of the easiest ways to kind of do that is to eliminate the sides that can't be used as the front. Uh, those of us who have been doing bonsai for a little while have heard the term pigeon breast or reverse pigeon breast. 
basically looking for where the curve undulates away from us or towards us are ways that we can kind of eliminate sides mm -hmm. that we can't use. Um, so in essence, if we turn the curve to where we're viewing it, we lose the movement and now we're seeing a straight line. The same thing is true if we turn it this way and we're looking into the curve, we're just seeing a straight line again and we're not utilizing the movement of the tree uh, the best way that we can. So basically my two fronts are somewhere in here, in that area, or in here, okay? I also have a degree of flexibility with the aptitude or altitude of the tree. I can tip it and change the front that way, lean it, but I don't want to catch that curve, um, either viewing it straight on, um, on the inside or on the outside, right on the outside of that curve. Um, so I have had a little bit of time to study the tree, and I do think I've settled in on a front. Um, I think we'll go somewhere in here. As I was studying the tree, I found that that kind of gives us the best movement, um, the best bark characteristics, and also kind of hides some of the flaws. There is a little bit of reverse taper on the trunk, and as we turn it, you might actually see that it gets a little fatter here at this section of the tree. So if we turn it and we catch it at its widest point, that gives us a nice line that we can start to build off of. So now that we've found a front, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna start removing some branches that I'm not gonna use in my design, branches that maybe are, there's too many growing from one point or branches that are growing too low. Uh, and as I work my way up the tree, I should start to see the design a little more clearly, start to see the framework that I'm keeping and start to make more intelligent and more deliberate choices as we go on. So right now, let's grab my concave cutter. Um, we carry Kanishin tools from Japan here at the nursery. Um, this is a Kanishin brand concave cutter. I really, really like the quality of this brand. Um, I've been really happy with all the tools that I've gotten from them. I do prefer uh, carbon steel, uh, only because it does seem to hold an edge a little longer, um, does seem to be a little more maintenance than the stainless, but I just think that they're sharper and, uh, and tend to get the job done a little better, in my opinion. So I do like the carbon, even though you will see stainless in my tool roll as well. So I'm going to start by removing some of these low branches. I'm not going to use any of these down this far on the trunk. I really want to open up this section and create some negative space and really show off uh, the size here of that trunk and some of the characteristics. If we leave this at the bottom, it gets a little too clustered, a little too obstructed, and we don't really see where the tree exits the soil, and we lose a bit of that visual. So I'm going to start there and remove that cluster. Now one thing that I tell all my students about Premnas um, is that you should root everything that you cut off. Um, this is a tree that grows extremely fast, and a lot of times the trees that I've bought for $25, $50, the cuttings that I've gotten off of those trees, I've actually liked better after a year or so of growing them. Um, not always the case, uh, but sometimes those cuttings can develop rapidly and take on some really cool shapes. Uh, so it, it's a really easy way to increase your bonsai collection um, and have more material to work on. So now I'm gonna work up the tree a little more kind of uh, following the rules where I don't want to have any more than two branches, at most three branches growing. Excuse me, Mike. Yep. We've got a question from okay. Corey. How Corey? long, yes. How long has it been in the training pot? Uh, Corey, I think this has probably been in the training pot for about two years. Um, if I remember correctly, that's when I remember Eric digging these up and potting these. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's been in this pot for about two years. So four years in the ground, two years in this pot, if my memory serves me correct. So I hope that helps, Corey. Um, any All other right, questions? We right? do. Mary has a question. Sure. All right. Her general question is, after you replant, defoliate, design, and wire the bonsai, do you repeat the process? Yes, um, so the basic process of bonsai, especially when styling something that it has been grown out and kind of just roughly pruned, is to go through and remove all the branches that uh, you know you're not gonna need, all the branches that are gonna kind of ruin your design down the road or might work against you down the road. So bar branches, uh, clusters of branches where there's five or so growing from one spot, 
and you'll go through and remove all that and you'll usually find that you're not left with that many branches. You're left with a handful, usually maybe more if you're lucky. And so the process is to then allow the tree to recover, grow new branches in new places, and then you'll go through that same selective process, removing all the ones that have grown that aren't in good places, leaving the ones that are, and hopefully adding new uh, good branches to the design each time you style the tree. Um, so there is a lot of uh, philosophy, a lot of uh, schools of thought on what the best way to train and style the tree is um, in that duration, but it all kind of boils down to that same fundamentals of looking for the proper branches, starting a great structure, and building from there. So yes, you will do this styling several times uh, before you get into refinement and really get into a more uh, pruning, fine pruning kind of regimen. So I hope that helps, Mary. Thank you. Uh, Bianca has a question. Sure, Bianca. Uh, when you try to grow the cuttings, any tips? Um, with, with Premna, not really. There, as long as you're in Florida, here in the tropics, they're almost 100% success rate just putting them in soil. Um, I usually strip the leaves. So like most cuttings, I would basically take off all the leaves here. Like that. I might even take my scissors just to speed it up and kind of cut some of this back. And we want to remove all the leaves so that the, the moisture stays in the cutting and it focuses more on roots instead of foliage, instead of transpiration. So once we get a cutting like that, I might cut below an inner node and I'll root a ton of these in one small container. And all I do is put it in dirt, put it in the shade and water it as it dries out for about two to three weeks. And you'll start to see that they'll start growing, put them right out in the sun and you're on your way. Um, so it's very, very easy. Uh, like I said, there's almost 100% success rate uh, just putting them straight in dirt. Um, big cuttings, small cuttings, I've rooted all sizes. Um, so I've even rooted, you know, large caliper, inch caliper cuttings. Um, they also air layer very easily. Um, so don't be afraid to just load a bunch of them into one pot and then separate them at a later date. The multiple cuttings that are in that pot will kind of help use up any excess water. So you don't want to take any cuttings and put them in a big pot while they root. Okay, so hopefully that, that helps you. And that's a couple of tips. Any others on there? I think you're good for now. All right, well, we're, I'm going to get back to just cutting out some of these clusters here. So what I'm trying to leave on these clusters is, again, I don't ideally want there to be any more than two branches growing from any one point. So we've all heard about bar branches in the past. Um, the same theory goes for three branches growing in one point. Uh, basically, you have uneven thickening. You, you have one thickening in the center, the main trunk, and then this one thickening one side, and this one on this side thickening that side. And so you get an uneven bulge in the center. So if you can limit that down to where two branches meet at one point, be the trunk and a primary, or where a secondary and a tertiary meet, uh, if you can just limit that to two, one pair, then you won't have those reverse taper issues going down the road. If you utilize more than that three, you can still get away with it for a time, but there will be a time where you need to go in there and thin it out or watch it for problems if it does start to develop reverse taper. All right. You ready for some more questions? Right. All right. So Veer uh, says, sometimes Premna branches, uh, branches die back. Is it because of root bound? Especially I find this in winters in India. Yes, um, so that's, that's actually an ongoing uh, topic for debate. A lot of these tropical artists in Taiwan and Malaysia have referred to it as withering branches. Uh, and it seems to happen mostly to refined premna. So as you start to get them hyper refined or to a, an extremely refined state, you will notice that they can randomly drop branches. Uh, one of the easiest ways to regulate that, that people have said, and that I've noticed on my premna, is to defoliate the tree and balance the vigor. So um, the best way to do that, which is a painstaking process, is to go through the tree, assess the vigor on each and every branch, and defoliate accordingly. So strong branches, you'll take more leaves, weak branches, less leaves, or none at all. Um, but what I've, I've even found with Premna is just doing a full defoliation on these uh, while we're warm, not in winter, but as we get through winter, right about now when I did mine, they do push forward on weak twigs again and it does seem to balance them out as several artists in Southeast Asia have said. 
Um, the other issue in winter, the biggest issue with uh, branch loss, is overwatering. So as the metabolism of the tree slows down around, uh, well for us it would be November, around fall, you'll notice that the tree no longer grows these giant water shoots or these long extensions quickly anymore. It takes many, many weeks to get the same growth that you got in a day or two during the summer. Um, so in the winter, they can be very apt to stay too wet. So if you look at this one here, um, I still have a few yellow leaves on it. These yellow splotchy leaves, a lot of us will take that as a sign that the Premna got too dry. And uh, unfortunately, during the winter months, nine out of 10 times, that's a sign that the Premna is staying too wet and that you're starting to get root rot here. Um, that is a big issue in winter, and so you really, really, really have to watch the watering. Very, very light watering through the winter months, through the months, even if it's warm outside, if the tree is not actively growing, it's not gonna actively use the water. So you need to really, really pull back on that during the winter months uh, until we get into warmer temps, and the tree will kind of tell you when it's ready to, when it's ready to go. When you start to see it vig vigorously pushing out or when it starts getting those shiny new growth on it, it's starting to wake up, basically starting to enter the growing season again and you can start watering normal again. Um, so there is a lot that goes into that question and an ongoing debate, uh, but it really does boil down to winter control of water and also vigor control on refined trees. Okay, so I hope that helps. All right, so we have another question from Carlos. Sure. Uh, can you fuse cuttings into thicker trunk? Uh, so that's something that honestly I, I haven't tried with Premna. Um, I have a, a sneaking suspicion that they won't. The only reason I say that is that I have done very, very hard bends uh, on Premna where the curves essentially touch one another, um, curve to curve and I have not seen those fuse into a, uh, a fused branch. Uh, they still are separate. I can still see that they're separate branches. So I have a sneaking suspicion that they, they're not great at fusing, uh, but it's not something that I've really put a lot of time into or really have a lot of experience with. Um, so I can't accurately say that they won't at all. Uh, so I hope that helps. Okay, so Adrian. Uh... What's up, Adrian? says, are there different rules to show him more than three branches at one spot or handlebar branches? Are rules any different with show him? Well, what I found is that they, it's not that the rules are different, it's that you might be given a little bit more slack. Um, you might, uh, they might overlook that. The show him are usually potted and once they get into refinement are usually potted into very small, tight uh, pots. They do grow, in my experience, a lot slower in refinement than trees that have access to bigger soil medium. So I would say that the rules are a little different, that you'll get cut a little slack, but still there are people out there that follow them to the fullest T, even with Shohin, and do still strive to really uh, take it to that next level and follow the rules by the book. So I think you can still make great shohin without following the rules in any bonsai you can make a great bonsai without following the rules you just have to be careful because you're entering into a territory where people who do follow the rules can no longer help you you know you're entering into abstract territory so you may come up with something that's artistically beautiful you may not so it's kind of just winging it at that point but i personally on like this premna this premna um, i do subscribe to the no more than two branches from one point um, if you don't, that's not a problem. It just means that you have to watch that area and keep an eye on it. And if it does start to develop into a problem, then you do need to take action or else you'll start to develop issues with reverse tape. Okay. Okay. A couple of people have requested that we move the camera a little closer. All right. So, uh, we can do that. I think, yeah, let's see what we got going on. All right, let's see if that works. Is that a little better? What are they saying? Uh, I think it's good. So it's good? Uh, we have another question from here. All right. Um, how many varieties are there exactly in Premna? 
I'm not sure on the exact amount of varieties. I do know there are several different species used in bonsai. Um, where some of the confusion comes in is that a lot of these botanical names I've noticed are synonyms. Um, so I've heard uh, people use the term Premna microphylla. I've heard them use obtusifolia. Um, I've heard them use Premna Japan japonica. Um, and so I'm not really too sure on how many exact uh, true species there are and how many of those names are synonyms. I do know that there are three that are primarily used in bonsai. Uh, Ceratifolia, Microphylla, um, and Obtusifolia. So whether some of those are synonyms or not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I have been told, and from what I understand, this is Premna Microphylla. Um, so until I'm told otherwise, we'll continue to use that, uh, that taxonomy. Um, and so I, I'm not really too sure, unfortunately, on how many exact species of Premna there are. But at least those, those three, okay, that I've seen used in bonsai. So again, just working through, now I might leave some clusters where there's two branches growing from one point, but that's basically leaving that uh, for a time to kind of hold momentum or to build the design until I can get true ramification to replace that, that branch. So I might leave pairs of twos at this point, coming right off one point. working through this. Another thing that I'm doing on these is trying to create um, angle changes and taper where I can find it. So what I mean by that is if I see a spot where um, a large branch splits and divides and goes into a smaller branch, I might at this point cut back to where the smaller branch is now my terminal, uh, terminal branch, basically going from the fat old branch to the skinny young new branch. So I'll create taper in that way as I move throughout the tree. And I like to do the clean out uh, before I ever even touch any wire. Otherwise, you'll just be cleaning out as you're wiring. And it just gives you a better idea of what you are going to be looking for in the tree if you do your clean out first and see what's available to you. Um, Mike, could yep. you go ahead and reintroduce yourself and go ahead and talk about how old the tree is that you're working on? So, hey guys, this is just one more time. This is, well, we'll probably do this a few more times, but this is Mike from Weigert's Bonsai. I'm one of the instructors here, and I'm working on a Premna microphylla from our nursery that was field grown here at the nursery. Um, to answer that question of age, this was field grown for four years in the ground. Um, and if I remember correctly, I believe it's been in this pot for about two years. So we're looking at a tree that's been about six years uh, in development. All right, Mike, uh, Mark has a question. Uh, sure, will Mark. you identify the front and side branches as you go up the tree? Yep, so this is gonna be my front here, right in this area. My first branch is gonna be over here. So this is gonna be my first section, and as I go up, I'm just working on these branches and removing ones that, if I find one that's on the inside of a curve, like there was here, there was one that was growing from right inside here, that was removed. I can, however, use this one that's just outside the curve. So I'm going to clean that up, reduce it down to two, and then move on to the next level. Okay. I also take this time, if I see any old cuts, um, old dead branches or stubs, you want to clean those off. And don't be afraid to uh, be aggressive on Premna, especially during their growing months. Um, they grow extremely fast. Uh, this was a tree over here, just to take a quick break and talk again about the material. Um, this was a tree that uh, I started working on last year in February. So this was a $50 tree bought from Weigerts, and I basically trunk chopped it in February to nothing. I did this for a, a club project for the Shofu Bonsai Club in Sarasota. And so every branch other than the main trunk line has been grown in one year's time. 
So I really, really do stress that you shouldn't be afraid to be aggressive and, and cut back to get better branches because you can grow your full tree back in eight months time. So this is uh, a tree I really do recommend just kind of getting rid of the problems early and not kind of uh, dragging your feet on, you know. Questions out there? Uh -huh. no. Anybody have any tropical questions unrelated to Premna? Right. So again, just working my way up slowly but surely. I'm losing more and more tree as I go. Okay. All right, so Mike, we've got a question from Corey. Um, right. How do you fertilize the trees? And also, what mix do you use uh, through the various growing stages? So, uh, first question, fertilizing. So, when I have a tree that I'm developing, me personally, uh, I want high nitrogen. I want something that's really gonna push vegetative growth and make the tree grow fast so that I can grow a structure quickly. Um, so something that we sell out here that, that really does the trick is called Harrell's. Um, it's a fertilizer that I believe is 24 in nitrogen. Uh, it's a time release green granular that you put on the surface of the soil and as you water it slowly releases fertilizer into uh, the tree. So that's pretty standard for development work. Um, as I get to more refined trees, me personally at home, uh, I've been using a lot of organics as well to kind of slow the growth back down. Um, so I tend to switch back from that, that high nitrogen fertilizer and I try to go to a low nitrogen uh, consistent feeding fertilizer. So the organic, it does feed each time you water it. Um, so it does have a little bit of a leg up on the time release which kind of releases in stages. So uh, I do like using that for refined trees so that I can control the length of the inner nodes a little easier so that I don't have to uh, rush out and prune them every single day or really, really watch how fast they grow. Um, so organics is really, really good for refining trees. Um, the soil mix that I use, uh, ideally, I do like to get them into a coarse mix early on for development, and I do like to give them ample uh, soil mass to grow in. Uh, so you'll see both of these guys are potted into the uh, coarse mix. Something I have noticed when going to the coarse mix is the trees do seem to stress on that first repotting over to a bonsai mix on a bare root. Um, so it does usually take a little bit longer, like a month, to kind of recover them back to where they're growing vigorously again after a full bare root. Uh, but once they're transferred over to a bonsai aggregate, that stress uh, and that um, that weakness after potting seems to disappear on subsequent repottings. So I do like to go to that coarse mix, and then again, as I go to refinement, I'll start to go to a finer mix. Um, this one is our, our fine Shohin mix that we sell out here that's got a finer particle and also Akadama in it. So Akadama's uh, very good at retaining moisture, and that really does slow down the growth as well, uh, which really adds to kind of refining the finer branches on the trees. So I hope that helps. All right, Mike, could you tell some tips on making the Premna thicken quickly? Yes, so the, the easiest way to make the, t uh, the Premna qu thicken quickly is to pot it in a large pot, let it root in, and then don't touch it. <laughs> so it, you really do, the trick is to let it grow unrestricted, um, and the more you prune it, this, the more you're slowing it down. So keep that in mind. So there is an art in bonsai that you'll see in Japan or in Taiwan, there's an art to how they grow things out. So there's a lot of vi vigor manipulation on how to grow something quickly and how to wire it and twist it and only keep and grow the best parts. Um, so one thing I've learned in the last four years of really growing things out long term uh, is that you want to start uh, as early as possible make the right choices on branches, and then put it in a big pot and let it grow out those properly chosen branches. If you just put any tree in the ground, 
or any tree in a big pot and let it grow, you're only gonna grow and magnify that same mediocrity that's already in the trunk. So you need to kind of create the interest first and then magnify it, you know, grow it out, the twists, the turns, um, angle changes, things like that. So uh, you do need to get that in early on the design Otherwise, you're just going to have to cut it back later um, on a big trunk and then peel a big wound, so on and so forth. So the best technique for growing thick branches is to set the branch where you want it and let it grow until it gets to the thickness that you're happy with. So for Shohin, I'm usually happy with pinky size, thumb size branches, um, so I don't have to wait as long. But if you're growing a large Project Premna and you want a branch that's wrist thickness, you're gonna to have to invest a couple of years into growing that out without pruning it. So that's the trick, the number one trick to getting thick branches, don't prune them. So. All right, uh, another question about the Premna. Sure. Are Premnas prone to any pest problems? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so every tree seems to have like a, a pro and a con, an Achilles heel. Uh, Premna can get pretty buggy. Uh, they do suffer from all the typical bugs, aphids, uh, mealybugs, scales, things like that. They also are really prone to spider mites. So this is a tree that uh, you do have to spray frequently. You will have to kind of deal with the pests frequently. Um, but if you have a good regimen and you're used to doing it already, it's it's really no worse than, than anything else. If you spray once a month or once every couple months, your problems with bugs will be very, very limited. All right, we have a question about a laurel oak. Yeah. Uh, how easy will laurel oak back bud, if at all? Very easy. So laurel oaks, in my opinion, are probably the easiest of the oaks to grow, uh, here in Florida at least. Uh, they, they dig up very, very easily. They back bud on old wood very, very easily. Um, they back bud on even the trunk itself, old trunks, very, very easily. So if you're interested in digging up a laurel oak or working with that, that's material that's very, very hardy um, that would be very, very forgiving as well. So yeah, I, I'd say go for it. Um, you know, don't worry about it too, too much. We've dug them out of the ground just like tropicals with almost no roots on them, and uh, they seem to do just fine. So they're definitely the, the hardiest oak that uh, I've worked with personally. All right, so Stephen uh, in the Boston area, has a dwarf jade. Uh, it's getting pretty leggy. All right. How hard can I prune it back to, re to promote new branching? And how long should I wait weather-wise? Um, well, if you're growing it indoors, uh, you won't really have to wait. If you are gonna grow it outdoors and whatnot, I'd wait until you get to the point where your outdoor temperatures aren't any cooler than maybe 65 at night. Um, you know, that's a great time to really head them back. Realistically, if you were to cut it back in the 50s, it probably wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, but you can cut them back very, very aggressively. Uh, you can defoliate them. I personally don't, but you can. Um, you can cut them back to bare trunks. Again, I don't personally do that, but you can. And uh, I personally like to cut them back to the last leaf set and then kind of let them back bud and then choose from there where to make my next cut. So you can be very, very aggressive though. Just wait till you warm up. Do you suggest a high nitrogen fertilizer also helping in thickening the Premna apart from large pots and ground grown? Um, we, so it will work to some degree, but it won't, not really, no. So the high fertilizer in a small pot won't really do too, too much because you're still going to be limited by the amount of roots you can grow and the amount of nutrients and soil that's available to the tree. So you don't have to put them in gigantic pots, but what you'll notice is that if you're in a small pot and you grow a branch four feet tall, then it's gonna be very, very hard to keep that branch full of leaves and not have it dry out in two to three hours. So that's why you also have to start working on the bottom as well, or start trimming off leaves down to just sets of two, in which case you're gonna grow it just as slow as if you didn't do any of that running the branches at all. So I personally do think they go hand in hand. You need to have uh, access to a lot of roots if you're gonna do that growing out cycle. If you're gonna really grow and try to thicken branches and trunks, you need to go in a larger pot um, and you need to not prune the tree as much. So it, it's almost like a, a catch 22 in that if you want thicker branches, you have to put off 
having the bonsai you want for a little bit of time. You see, or you just have to wait a long, long time. So, I hope, hope that helps. All right, uh, Justin has a question. Uh, when the leaves die, do you just leave them on the top of the soil naturally, or do you pick them off? No, so, so bonsai, especially Japanese bonsai, is all about the details. Uh, and so, when you finish working on your trees, if, if you subscribe to the Japanese method, you should clean your area you should treat the top of the soil with respect and clean it to the best of your abilities. Remove any wire scraps from it. Um, that's why they sell those little brushes that you, you see. I used to think that those were kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, I used to think they were gimmicky, um, but they really do have a purpose to kind of clean up your area, clean the topsoil, and treat the tree with reverence and respect. Um, that alone, just the, the presentation of the tree, even inadequate material or subpar material, if it's elevated and treated with reverence, I've seen some of these, uh, I've seen trees that aren't even that great that look excellent in photographs because of the way that they're presented and the reverence that they're kind of bestowing on these trees. So always kind of treat your trees with respect and when you're finished, clean up the, the topsoil, pull any weeds, try and treat them like you would a pet or anything else that you really, really value. All right, um, Gary would like to know, what is your go-to pest spray? And uh, do you use it as a regular treatment or only when you see a problem? So my number one pest spray is Tall Star. It's, a, uh, it's similar to like Bayer 3-in-1 that you can get uh, over the counter at Home Depot. Uh, I use that to control most uh, insects like aphids, scales, leaf hoppers, mealybugs, things like that. The only thing that it won't work on are chili thrips that we get on buttonwoods and some other trees and also spider mites. So I use Tall Star for almost everything, but if I need to, I'll also use Avid, A-V-I-D. Um, and I use that as a miticide and also to treat chili thrip uh, infections or uh, outbreaks with uh, buttonwoods. So I'll get rid of it with that. So Avid's a more expensive chemical, um, so you really, don't want to buy that if you're just getting into bonsai unless you really want to get a buttonwood um, but tall star is a relatively cheap chemical that works great on most pests um, and it's really all, all i would recommend realistically so okay and one little um movement could you, we move the premna to your left side well the, the one you're working on um it's kind of getting uh mixed with there the bogey go. I think that's we'll do a, better. We'll do a shift. Yeah, right? A little movement. Much better, Mike. Thank you. No worries. All right. So, are you ready for another question? Yeah. Um, Anita likes to use compost. However, is chemical better? No, no, it's not. It's, it, so, just high nitrogen, synthetic fertilizers, it's great and it does uh, grow the tree quick, but everything has a pro and a con. And there's a lot of guys who will use organics or compost and just use it that way and grow the, the tree with a lower nitrogen. So the tree will still grow healthy and it will grow fine. It just won't grow as fast. Um, fast growth has its own drawbacks. So it's not always desirable to have fast growth. So I think you've got to find the, the method that works best for you and find uh, the speed at which you want to create your bonsai. So I hope that, hope that helps out. Uh, Manny would like you to speak a little bit about the Podocarpus species. He finds them to be finicky when repotting or Yamadori's collected. Uh, also, any other tips or tricks fertilizing, styling, etc.? Fertilizing, styling. Uh, uh, Podocarpus. So yep. the Podocarpus, uh, Podocarpus I treat just like most of our other conifers. I, I try to collect them if I can at the beginning of spring. So you'll usually see just when they start to grow is a good time to collect them. Um, and I'll usually, this is a little different than most conifers, I'll usually go through and half cut or two thirds cut all of the, the leaves slash needles on the entire tree and then try to collect as big of a root ball as I can. Um, the next thing that I do is I keep it in the shade and water very, very carefully. So uh, one of the biggest reasons that people tend to not do well with conifers when collecting them in Florida is they tend to stay too wet in the soil uh, so you want to be very very careful not to overwater them I usually kind of uh, 
mist them one day and we'll water the soil heavy the next day, mist them another day, water the soil heavy the next. Um, but it's all a case by case basis and tree by tree basis. So um, styling wise, I do like to style them just like other conifers. I usually attack them in the fall. So um, I'll usually style them in the fall and then do my repots in the spring if the tree has responded well and is nice and healthy and isn't having any issues. Um, styling, again, I usually do a two-thirds leaf cut to kind of open up the canopy and to get my wire in there. Uh, and design-wise, I almost uniformly kind of style them, obviously, as conifers, sweeping branches and branch pads uh, arranged the same way as like a juniper or a pine. So I, I hope that helps. If you need me to elaborate on any of that, just send another one on there and we'll go ahead and touch more on that. All right, uh, Adrian would like to know if you could recommend a few different brands of fertilizer with a low NPK, something easy to find, especially here in Southwest Florida. So one that I use at home that I really like that's cheap that uh, my buddy Seth turned me on to what is called Eco Scraps, E-C-O, S-C-R-A-P. Um, they used to sell it at uh, Lowe's. I, I haven't been able to find it there lately, but I get it on Amazon all the time. It's like $7 for a bag of it. And, uh, and then I buy Japanese tea bags to put it in. So Japanese loose tea bags. And, uh, and that seems to be a good combination. So I've had a, a good success with those two. I really enjoy the fertilizer. Um, it's made from food scraps. So it's a little different than like the manure based fertilizers. Still smells terrible, um, but I, I do really like it. It's really cheap, seems to be a good fertilizer. My trees have really responded well uh, when I've used them. So. Um, okay, so we've shifted the table since this question. Um, Beer has a question. The shohin that you have in the growth pot next to you, um, Yes. Yeah, that one. Okay, so uh, could you give some tips on shifting that into a bonsai pot um, to reduce the shock from the drastic uh, root prune? Also, the aftercare after it's repotted. So, um, because I'm in an aggregate mix, and this one specifically has been a bonsai before and has been in a small pot, I'm not super worried about uh, shocking it when I do a, a heavy root prune. So in a perfect world, um, as you're developing trees, you should be developing here as well. It, it shouldn't just be four years of developing the top and then starting to focus on the bottom. It should be a little bit of the top, a little bit of the bottom, a little bit of the top, a little bit of the bottom. Um, so things that I've done in the past to make it so I won't have as many issues is I have gone in every other year and pruned back uh, some roots, got them to divide, have uh, pruned the roots to ha have a more dense, more refined root ball so that I know that I will have a lot of feeder roots when I do decide to go back down to a bonsai pot. Uh, what you don't want to do is not mess with the roots and only mess with this and then allow a ton of circling roots where all the feeders are concentrated at the end of that circling root and then when you need to pot it, you have to cut all your feeders off to go in a bonsai pot. That's when trees tend to stress and you have a lot of issues with that. If you're properly maintaining the roots and you're developing the roots um, at a similar rate that you're developing the top, you shouldn't have uh, as much of an issue. So what I would do when I'm ready to repot this is I'm going to defoliate it again. So I just defoliated this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then of course I found the perfect pot for the tree after I had already done that. So I'm gonna wait till May and I'm gonna defoliate it completely again. And I'm gonna prune it down and reduce it. And I'm gonna put it into a shallower pot. And I may do other things like uh, put a soil collar on temporarily to kind of raise and elevate some soil so it has a little extra soil. Um, I may do some, some other things depending on the issues that I find once I get in there. But, I don't anticipate any, and I don't really anticipate having too many stress issues just because of the, the preparation work that I've done leading up to this. All right, so Thomas Stone says he has a bald cypress um, that he wants to repot into a bigger container, but the leaves are getting kind of yellowish. Uh, he started fertilizing, but he's not sure if it's okay to repot. 
Well, to, uh, to be honest, it's it's kind of a little late to repot cypress. Um, if it's still in organic soil, it, it's it's definitely late. We're going into April. The cypress are best repotted usually no later than February. We do a lot of ours in January even. Um, but ideally, the time is you want to get them before they leaf out. Uh, if it never went dormant, that, that could still play into it. Um, one of the best things I can tell you is it sounds to me like you're probably facing overwatering. Um, so you may want to see if you're, if you're watering it every single day and you're soaking the soil and it hasn't grown a ton and it only has a few leaves, back off on the watering. Um, also, if you live here in Florida, did he say you lived here in Florida? Um, oh. It does not say. Um, so if, if you live locally or you can do it, you can always bring the tree here and we can assess it with you and kind of take a look at it and tell you, uh, give you an idea of what's been going on with it at least. So I, I hope that helps out. If you have any other questions, you know, just shoot it on the message board and we'll elaborate a little more. Um, Nikki wants to know, will Will you be root pruning uh, this Premna today? No, no, I'm not gonna pot them. I'm just gonna do a styling today. Um, it's probably still a little early to pot Premna. I usually wait until May to start my pottings on Premna, even though I have been chomping at the bit. And, uh, and at my own house, I was toying with the idea of going a little early, but I still think it's the safest to wait till around May to start uh, really that's when they seem to be growing the most vigorously and when they really seem to have uh, woken up from kind of that winter slumber. So I typically wait. Um, he also wanted to know, uh, I guess you kind of answered that, uh, you're not doing a complete defoliation today because it's too much stress on the tree? No, I, I think we're, we're actually, this is a great time to completely defoliate your premnas. Um, in the last two or three years, I've been on a pretty consistent cycle of doing this. Uh, last April, I defoliated all my premnas, and uh, any of the, the crummy leaves or vigor deficiencies that I have, it did seem to cure those vigor deficiencies. So weak branches or weak areas of the tree, as the tree came back right away, uh, it seemed to have alleviated those concerns. Um, so I've gotten into the habit and this year I did do a little early just because we were so warm and about two, two and a half weeks ago I defoliated this guy completely, this guy completely, and this guy completely, I think three weeks ago. Let me move him over here. So all three of these were defoliated at the end of March, very end of March. So a good rule of thumb, wait for April and defoliate the, the winter leaves or the old distress leaves. And from what I've seen over the last few years, I haven't had any issues with them coming back. Now, you always run the risk, you know, especially in March, of possibly getting a cold snap. And hypothetically, if we were to get a, a frost or something like that after defoliating the Premna, it wouldn't be a great situation. But it's unlikely to happen, and I think you just play it smart, you know, you can get away with, with doing that around March, April. So. Okay, a couple of questions. Um, Do you defoliate the Premna using a scissor or do you use a pressure hose for it? Uh, also, do you remove the whole leaf or two thirds of the leaf? So that's a, a really good question. So the pressure thing might work. Um, I, I don't have a ton of experience with the small spot guns and whatnot, but one thing I'd be concerned about and I'm not sure how it would do is once you get to really, really fine branching, I don't know if I'd go that route. You know, when you're first kind of starting the tree or when you're building structure, I don't think it's as big of an issue. But I think as you're getting finer and finer branches, you do want to take the time as, as daunting and as mundane as it can be, you do want to take the time to get in there and get all the leaves off of there. Um, I do try to do a complete defoliation. Um, there are only a few times where I won't do that. It, if it's a super weak bud, if I see an area where I, I, it's essential to the design of the tree, it's extremely weak, I know that by defoliating it, I'm gonna lose that, that branch or that section. I'll leave uh, some leaves on that section. Uh, but no, I don't necessarily half cut them. I try to get them all the way off. And uh, with Premna, as you can see, it's extremely dense and it's not exactly easy to get the leaves off with any tool, scissors, tweezers, anything. So what I do is I use scissors, tweezers, and these fat fingers here, 
and these fat fingers pull a lot of those leaves off. Um, in the thicker areas, the more robust areas, I feel okay to use these. On the finer, newer branches, I use my scissors. Um, on areas where these fat fingers can't get into, I use the tweezers. So I use a mixture to really get in there. Same with neas or any other small leaf tree like that. All right, so um, do you plan to carve the heavy top um, and how do Premnas handle carving? Premnas handle carving fine. I'm not gonna carve it. So I'm going to probably just angle cut it and try to heal it is my plan. So I'm going to take my saw. Oh, it's in front of my face. And I'm going to try to cut that, like give it a notch, um, and then allow branches to run off this section to kind of heal them. So I'm going to stand up real quick. I'm probably going to lose my head, but I have to do it. So I apologize if my head is missing. Mike, we got eight more minutes until three o'clock. All right. We have a couple more questions. All right. Um, Joey says, uh, when you have a large specimen that you want to turn into a shohen sumo, uh, what steps are taken to fit that into a small pot over time in regards to trunk chopping and root work? So, can you read the question one more time? Yes. Uh, when you have a large specimen that you want to turn into a shohen sumo, what steps are taken to fit it into a small pot over time in regards to trunk chopping and root work? So trunk chopping can be tricky. You first want to choose a species that you're going to be able to heal the wound or uh, utilize the large piece of deadwood that you're going to leave behind because you are gonna have residual after that if you're going from a large caliper trunk to a shohin. Um, the first thing I would do in theory is trunk chop it to the desired uh, height, okay? And then I would try to reduce the roots as much as I safely could for that sitting. So maybe I'd say for a three gallon, maybe reduce it by two gallons, pot it up, let it recover, and then see how it goes from there. Um, you could always go for broke, and just pot it all the way down and hope that the residual energy in the trunk kind of uh, bounces back and saves the tree. But I think it's better to do it in stages, especially on older material. Are we, we're stopping at three? I, I'm sure you can continue, but it was only supposed to be an hour long. Oh. Ta-da. Look at that. Um, uh, Corey would like to know, do you bear root all tropical? Uh, not sure if you've answered that question already. Uh, 
I do bare root as, as much as I can. I do not grow or train trees uh, in organic soil. Um, I might train, I shouldn't say I don't train them. Uh, I don't long term uh, train any of them in uh, nursery soil. I think you're just gonna run into too many problems down the road and I think as your tree refines, it's gonna be too hard to balance the water and balance the vigor on the tree and, and manage the roots if you're in organic soil. So I think at a certain point in time, you will have to abandon it and, uh, and move on to an aggregate. Now, what aggregate you use, people have been arguing about that forever. And realistically, I think it's just gonna be determined by how you water. You know, it's all based on how you water and that's gonna dictate how well an aggregate works for you and what ingredients are gonna be best for you, if that makes sense. So Akadama is a, a common, commonly uh, used ingredient in Japanese bonsai. And a lot of people say it's like the end all be all to bonsai. And I do really like it as an ingredient, but there are a lot of people out there who are growing trees, not in Akadama, uh, who are also still growing great trees and are still having great success in the art of bonsai and have been doing so for many generations uh, without Akadama. So it's all technique and it's just um, what works best for you and what's gonna allow you to learn the technique the easiest. So here at Weigert, our mix that Eric really likes is uh, lava mixed with expanded shale and a little bit of pine bark. Um, we also have a shohin mix that's basically uh, Akadama, expanded shale, and then lava with smaller particulate. Um, and so there, we also have the old Florida mix, which is turfus, lava, and pine. So there's a lot of different aggregates you can make and you'll find one that works great uh, for your bonsai garden. So this cut paste that I'm putting on, you guys are probably wondering why I'm licking my finger constantly. It's because it has to be applied with a wet hand. I don't always V-cut the top like this. It's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes I'll flat cut it. It just determines, usually it's, it's determined by kind of the rate of taper um, and whether I want to heal a gigantic uh, flat wound and build up a kind of piece of scar tissue that might impact my design or my trunk line. Um, and so if I need to kind of whittle down some of that taper and kind of build taper in the design. An easy way to do that is to create like a wedge cut like this. The important thing to remember when making any big cut is that you ideally want to position that cut in between two branches. Okay, so as this branch grows out, it will heal this section. And as this branch grows out, it will heal this section. Now, the other thing is it looks pretty aggressive. Um, some of the mistakes that I've made in the past with doing wedge cuts are not being aggressive enough. Um, so you'll see there's actually a wedge cut here. You can see that this wedge cut here that I did at the top uh, didn't quite go deep enough and the scar tissue was allowed to kind of build up further and kind of filled in that spot to where it started looking like a bar again. And so I'm gonna have to re-wedge re re cut it more aggressively to kind of break up that line and make it not look so uh, straight across, like a T. So that's what I'm trying to avoid here, is to be a little more aggressive on this go around. So now I'm gonna start doing some of the wiring real quick. And I'll work through if I see any branches that I don't like as I'm going, I'll kind of work through them at that point. All right, I'm gonna move the camera a little bit closer since we're getting towards the end. Okay. 
So when I'm wiring, I start at the bottom of the tree and work my way up. Um, especially during structural wiring, I do like to wire with um, sizable wire if I'm trying to move any, any branches that might be difficult to move. At this point, I definitely want to maybe overhandle them with wire if they're large branches and I need to move them uh, more than a few degrees. So if I'm just kind of placing branches and I'm just moving them lightly or not going very far, I'll just usually use half the diameter of the branch. If I really need to crank on something and really move it down, I might go up to the diameter of the branch. Do we have any questions so far? A lot of people are saying you did a great demo, and might. They would like to see some of your trees. Some of the what? Some of your show. Oh, cool, yeah. If you um, want to zoom in while I'm working this. I'm trying to see it. Okay. So the way I wire, um, I typically try to wire in 45 degree uh, to 50 degree spirals. Um, that seems to be what a majority of the people who do this professionally seem to agree upon. Um, some guys go a little wider, some guys a little shallower, uh, but I think 45, 50 degrees is a good way to start. I'm not a master wire by any means, uh, but I have been wiring for many, many years and I found things that work really, really well for me and I found things that don't work very well for me. Um, so a lot of this is kind of built from experience rather than uh, just reading it. Not positioning yet I'm just moving branches out of my way as I'm working Everybody having fun at home, playing with their bonsai, I hope. Could be worse than sitting around wiring trees at the nursery, I'll tell you that. Oh, I did miss a couple questions. Sure. Um, any advice for repotting or generally working with sweet acacia? So you want to treat them, they are tropicals, so they kind of do subscribe to the most of the tropical rules. A good time to start repotting them, you could probably start now. They are very, very hardy trees, uh, so you could probably start repotting now. Um, best time is probably when we're, like in May is the best time to really start. Um, don't take too many roots off of them during repotting. That's often when people have issues with them, is being too aggressive on the roots. Um, so make sure you do leave enough roots to kind of survive the repotting. And if you see roots that are problem roots, circling roots, anything like that, make sure you leave those on the first potting, cut as much as you can, um, and then come back on subsequent years and kind of whittle it away as you can. Uh, but don't try to fix all your problems in one sitting. Um, so one thing I do that, you know, some guys do, some guys don't do, on this species of trunk, smooth bark trunks, I'm not super worried about crossing the front of the trunk with the wire. I used to be uh, really, really against that. I would use a lot of three-point anchoring, uh, but what I found in recent years is especially on the initial styling, 
and when I really need to get branches moved where I need them is it can be difficult to get the movement I need and the hold I need um, without kind of going around that trunk and really securing the heavier wire. So that's one of the reasons why I do use that in that way, why I do cross the trunk like that. Another thing about Premnas is if you're working with older Premna stock or branches that have maybe hardened off, you're gonna notice that they're, they're kind of brittle, okay? You're gonna run a high likelihood of cracking or damaging branches on the Premna and you shouldn't worry about it to some degree. If you crack a Premna branch or even really crack it two thirds of the way through, as long as you pace the branch and allow the branch to grow freely for a little bit of time, you can heal those wounds no problem. So it's not something that uh, I really worry about a ton with Premna as far as, um, as far as that goes. Um, I Kingsville Boxwood, can uh, we grow those here in Southwest Florida? Sure. And any advice on them? No, I, I've never really worked with Kingsville too, too much, so I don't have a ton of advice on them. Um, I know I've heard that they're very, very touchy, uh, so it's never been a plant I've really wanted to mess with too, too much. Um, they do grow down here, and I have seen some nice specimens. Um, care would probably be similar to any other bonsai. Uh, I would probably repot them at the spring, so now would be a good time to repot them. Uh, the general rule of thumb with those temperate broadleaf trees is around springtime when buds are just starting to to move and you're starting to grow. Uh, that is a good time right before buds emerge and break fully out. It's a good time to pot your uh, temperate broadleaf trees. So I would probably say that that's a safe bet with the boxwood as well. Mike, how long will you leave the wires on until the branch holds its shape by itself? Yep, uh, so the wire stays on. Uh, until it starts to just barely cut in, or even at times, especially on Premna, until it cuts in pretty heavy. Uh, I'm not super concerned with minor cut in on Premnas or sea hibiscus because it will grow out really fast, uh, very quickly. Um, to answer your question, I leave it on until I start to see it swell, and then I only remove that link that's cutting in. So if it's two links that are cutting in and the rest is fine, I just remove the two links and I slowly remove as it starts to cut in. So you'll notice that that wire, parts of it will stay on for a year and parts of it will stay on for a month. So it really just, you have to get into a good habit of having a routine where you check your trees constantly. You have to check your trees, check your wire, and even then, even with a good routine, there's gonna be times where you miss it. So you wanna develop that good routine where you're checking the structure of your tree checking on the wire, making sure that you're not developing any problems. All right, Mike. Um, why, uh, why use a bigger wire th than the branch versus using two smaller wire side by side? Um, it's not as strong. So you, the two wires side by side won't equal the same strength as just one good wire. The other reason is that when doing a lot of wiring, so when wiring a lot of branches at one point, um, if you're, you're only technically given, well, so they say, one of the rules is you don't want to stack more than three branches per, three wires per branch. So if you use two wires every time you're wiring a branch, then that means you're really using up a lot of your precious moves. Uh, to then go back and wire other branches. So it's really, it's just too much wire where one will do. You want to, ideally in a perfect world, you're trying to wire your tree with the least amount of wire possible. You're trying to get every branch wired. Um, without having to double up, it's not gonna be possible, but the least amount of wire. You wanna choose correctly on what size wire to move the branch, not having to go back and double up to move the branch. Um, it's kind of an exercise in efficiency. Um, and Mike, uh, what do you hope to be the finished height for the tree you're working on? So um, I would probably say finished height around in here. So not much taller than where I've had it. So you'll see, once you get to a silhouette mode in bonsai, you'll kind of see this exterior shell. And we call that the silhouette. And that is the kind of final height and the final frame of your design 
But what people don't understand is you have to cut it in and then let it grow back out to your silhouette and then in and then out and then in and then out several times to really build out the final branches to get to this point. So we're gonna, uh, this will be the final height, but after we cut it back and regrow taper and more branches several times. Uh, Carlos says here in Puerto Rico, very big cuts on Premna tends to kill some part of the trunk. Do you have experience the same here? We actually have not had that, that experience um, with these guys. Uh, we, I have not, honestly, I have not seen too much dieback on these guys from cuts. Uh, and you can see on this guy, there were some large cuts that were made. I mean, granted, this was when it was in the field. But these were large cuts, and uh, these ones specifically didn't have any dieback. Um, Maybe we, we might want to talk about that, uh, Carlos, and kind of see, because that I'm interested to understand why that could possibly be happening too. Um, possibly the big cuts and then with the, the rainy climate down there could play into it, uh, but I'm not really sure. I'm just kind of guessing at that. Um, I have not personally seen that issue here, uh, but like I said, uh, our biggest cuts have maybe been three or four inches across. So. If you're doing bigger cuts than that, I, don't, I haven't seen any of those personally, so I can't comment. But three, four inches across, we haven't really had any issues with that. Um, all right, Bruce wants to know, should you use a fairly large pot on the first potting of the Premna before trying to shoehorn into a smaller pot? Yes, so I like to Personally, I like to just mesh the bottom of my nursery pot or a, a large pot and pot it into that and save myself the cost of a container. Now, that's a very utilitarian approach and I'm sure that's not gonna sell with everyone to look at an ugly nursery container for the duration of their training. Uh, so you could just get an oversized bonsai pot and then have some of the aesthetic of bonsai while still achieving your goals of growing the tree out. So I think that would work pretty good. Now, one thing that I am a big advocate of with Premna, especially being a shohin grower, um, one of the ways that I kind of develop these trees is I look at it as trying to divide two pairs of twos. Uh, Premnas are an opposite grower, so they grow uh, two branches per node, and so you'll see one to the left, one to the right. Um, so as I'm ramifying these trees, I'm always trying to just pull two branches, a bifurcation. So I'll look for a split as far back on each branch as I can and cut back to that. And then push out two more branches and then cut those back as hard as I can to get the densest forking I can. Um, that isn't necessary for all bonsai, but I found it to be very, very uh, successful with shohin trees specifically, is really, really being aggressive on forcing that initial divide as far back on the branches as you can. Mike, a uh, viewer would like to know, does Premna take thread grafting? Um, Premna, I, I haven't done an actual thread graft on Premna per se, uh, but they do approach graft fine. So um, I'd assume they do just fine with all types of grafts. I have no reason to doubt that they'd uh, handle a thread graft fine. Um, so I'd say go for it. Um, if you're at all worried, try an approach graft first. It's a little easier graft to accomplish and uh, I'm sure you'll be pleasantly surprised that they graft just fine. Um, Rick Johnstone says, hey, how, Rick. S <laughs> how snug is your wire depending on the species and growing season? It, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's as tight as I, I can get it. The wire needs to always, regardless of species, be in contact with the branch at all times. So the, the way that you break branches when moving the, the branches is these gaps that will form or these, these spaces and that allows tension to build up and work its way down towards that gap 
and that's where the branch is unsupported and you'll break the branch. So regardless of species, and so if you see gaps on my tree, it wasn't intentional, um, but all of these gaps you'll see are as tight as I can get them to the trunk. I'm not cinching it in to pinch it, but I'm literally laying it on uh, to where it's in contact with the trunk and there is no space in between the wire and the branch, okay? So, Uh, Gail would like to know, is this extremely hot and dry weather hurting our trees? Um, no, I think it's actually, it's actually gonna get really, really good for our trees. I think the one thing that we're missing that we really need to wake our trees up is a good rain. Um, I think once we get some rain, you'll notice that everything is really starts bouncing back. Um, but until that point, I think what a lot of people are probably uh, dealing with right now is that your trees are still kind of lagging due to the, the kind of winter dormancy uh, and haven't quite fully woken up yet. And so it's a point in time where you feel like you need to water more and more and more, but the trees aren't necessarily ready for it yet. So a lot of stuff looks unhappy at this time of year. And so what, all I can say is just watch the watering, be careful not to over or underwater anything to the best of your abilities, and as we get further into the season, I think things will kind of equalize and get a little easier to uh, maintain. Uh, do you have some tips on Nabari development for Premna, please? Yeah, so Nabari development, um, something that we overlook a lot of in, uh, I shouldn't say U.S. bonsai, but a lot of it, uh, Florida bonsai at least, you'll see we do tend to overlook a lot of that Nabari development. Um, Premna develop really, really cool Nabaris very, very easily. They give off adventitious roots all the time. Uh, where basically roots are pushing out wherever the, the, the trunk is in contact with the soil. Uh, so it is very, very easy to just layer roots onto the tree if you need to. Um, what that means is essentially uh, girdling the trunk of the tree and building up soil so that roots can kind of pour out into the new medium and then you would cut it uh, just below the new root set. That's very, very easy. Um, one thing that you'll see on this tree that I've done is I tried my best when I first started the cutting to get the roots as radial as possible. So I tried to get roots growing out uh, evenly all around the trunk. Now the next thing you'll notice is that not all the roots grow at the same speed. So some get fat quickly and some are still skinny. So what I do is every couple years or whatnot, every year I go in there and any of the thick roots that are very, very big, I'll cut in half, maybe cut them back to where they're just a little stub and then cover those with soil and I'll leave the thinner roots untouched. I won't prune those. And so that allows them to kind of catch up and thicken to the, the fat one and the fat one can, will divide and start to grow slower. So everything will kind of catch up to an even look, an even uh, uh, diameter on all of the roots and ideally they'll be going um, radially all around the trunk. So that's the ideal way of working the Nabari, but basically no crossing roots no gaps in the, the bottom of the, uh, the roots. I don't like seeing um, like legs like that where I can stick something underneath. Um, even quick fixes like sticking a rock in there is never quite looks as natural as it should uh, because the tree didn't grow over the rock when it was young. It was just kind of placed in that cavity. So it, try and find bases where you don't have any gaps to where the roots are in contact with the soil. Um, no crossing roots, as radial as possible, and roots should all be uh, similar diameter in size. So I hope that helps. Um, 
Adrian would like to know the best time to repot a juniper Itogawa? Uh, well, the best time to repot junipers is early, early spring. So I'd say probably end of February would have been the best time to pot that tree. What about trimming it? Um, trimming it the best time is, uh, I mean, you could trim it now, but the best time to really do a styling, in my opinion, here is in the fall. Um, I will style all the way up to April. I don't do any styling of junipers after this point because we're gonna hit rainy season soon. And if you thin out the juniper before we hit rainy season, you can have a lot of issues maintaining it um, through that period if it's not full enough. So that's all just my own take on it. That's my own experience. So, you know, you can take from that what you will, but uh, growing junipers in Florida for a long time, almost every single one that I've really hard styled before rainy season, before I could get it potted to the appropriate mix, um, has had issues and, uh, and did not make it uh, if I did it too late in the season. So I do like to do most of my hard cutbacks, hard work in the fall, uh, definitely stopping any of that work uh, at, at April. Is the, that's the cutoff. Feronia lucida. Um, no, honestly, I, I can't even lie to you. Feronia is not a species that we see too often here. Uh, it is a very, very cool species that's grown uh, in Southeast Asia and countries like that. Um, but I haven't seen too many of them here, so I don't have a ton of experience with that. What I can tell you about bonsai technique, though, is that the, the thickening theory, growing things large, is the same regardless of the plant you're working on. So whether it's a feronia, a, a premna, a juniper, a pine, it still goes back to carefully choosing what branches you want to thicken and then allowing unrestricted growth until that tree reaches that thickness. So you can't um, prune without slowing the tree down. So every time you prune the tree, you're dividing energy, you're taking away energy, you're slowing the tree down. So think of it like that. You wanna basically get the movement in your branch first, get movement in a branch that's growing from a good location, and then if I want this branch thicker, then at that point I would let it kind of run freely for a year or two years, however long I need to get it where I want it to be. But pruning it's only gonna slow it down. Mike, how do you keep ants away? Uh, tall star. So I use tall star and if I need to, if they get into the pot, then you will have to do like a drench and kind of drench the whole pot. Um, but that's the, the primary way that I get rid of uh, fire ants or ants in general. Kristen wants to know, uh, do you have plans to go to Costa Rica? I'd love to, no, but I'd love to. Do I have an invite? No, I, I do have a lot of travel plans this year. Um, I am traveling to uh, Austin, Texas to teach out there, which I'm really excited about. Um, also going to Milwaukee, Chicago, um, hopefully going to hang out with Carlos out there in PR this year, but um, all these travel arrangements are all kind of, you know, up in the air right now, just seeing what, what goes on, so. Uh, Corey says, so prune for movement first, then grow to thicken? Prune and wire for movement first, exactly. And then you wanna thicken that movement. So you don't wanna just thicken a boring branch. You wanna thicken something that's gonna be cool, that's gonna have character in it. Austin is coming up in June. Um, I have to double check the date and have to look at it. Um, 
and I'm actually not sure of where exactly in the city I'm teaching at, but it's for the uh, the Austin Bonsai Club there. And so if you if you wanted to meet up, uh, you can always shoot me an email or hit me up on Facebook afterwards, and I'd love to uh, share those details with you, and maybe we can meet in person and talk some bonsai when I'm there. Starting to position some of these branches. What does it feel like? Lisa says June 10th. June 10th, awesome. Uh, would a buttonwood survive south, Southern California? You know, I, Southern California, I think it would, honestly. There's uh, some people that have been growing buttonwoods up north too. Um, recently that I've been talking to that have been doing pretty well uh, growing them under lights during the winter as well uh, and they're far colder than uh, Southern California I think the biggest thing would be humidity um, but I honestly don't think you'll have issues with that I think it'll be fine out there so I'd say just like dealing with any new material the safest thing to do is start small get a cheap one first um, see how it does in your area once you kind of have it down and you understand the horticulture of it and you're confident in it, then you know really find a, a nice piece of material to continue with. So when I'm putting movement into these branches, I just want to create a, a movement that kind of mirrors or at least harmonize, harmonizes with the trunk, something that uh, has a good relationship with the trunk. So if my trunk is straight, I don't wanna put in these huge undulations like maybe you've seen on some of my trees where it's like a corkscrew. I wanna just put in maybe gentle movement, maybe even just straight branching and let my pruning and those directional changes be my movement as I go forward. Um, so you could always build movement in the branches that way and some people argue that's better. Um, for trees that have kind of an informal curve, I like to gently put in up and down movement, side to side movement. Uh, so I'll usually start by just putting an up and down undulation into the branch, up and down, and then a side to side. The next thing I do is I check my branches to make sure that nothing is stacked on top of one another so that everything will get sunlight when we're finished here. Yeah, the top's not done yet, but yeah. So there are some branches at the top that I have left that I won't be leaving long term. Um, some areas in here that I probably won't be leaving long term, but I think that we could get away with leaving them uh, for now. And as I work my way up there, I'm probably going to remove at least one more from that cluster just to try and clean it out a little bit better. Does root bound cause dieback for uh, tropical species? It can, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you do, if a tree is root bound, it can cause all sorts of issues. Um, nutrient uptake can be a big one. Another one is watering. So a, a frequently misdiagnosed thing that I see a lot is root bound trees where people tell me that, oh, I've, I've been watering it, watering it, watering it. I don't think it's a watering issue. I don't think it's it's too dry. I've been watering it. Uh, once a tree is pot bound, you'll notice that the water tends to be repelled or goes around the sides of the root ball. So even if you're seeing your tree and you're seeing that the water is coming out the drain holes, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've watered the tree adequately. You have to check and make sure that that water is penetrating um, and getting in there before you can actually uh, say that you've watered thoroughly. So if the water's not penetrating the root ball, then you're, you're still just uh, underwatering the tree, even if it's coming out the drain holes. So that's why repotting is so important, is to ensure proper watering, ensure uh, that the tree can grow new roots, that it has adequate room to move around, um, and also to uh, give it an easier ability to uptake nutrients. There are drawbacks to repotting too frequently though as well. 
and that trees that are repotted less often tend to dwarf better and tend to stay dwarfed longer. So the uh, pot binding a tree will help dwarf it and help grow it slowly. So it's not always a, uh, a, a easy answer when that comes. If you can keep the tree healthy uh, in the long run without repotting it, then that's the best answer. But usually that will eventually wear out and you'll get to a point where the horticulture is too difficult and you'll have to repot the tree to keep it healthy. Mike, yep. Gary would like to know uh, what style would you call this tree? Just informal upright probably. indicator that it's a that it's getting there so yeah if you start seeing roots escaping um, from the pot then that's a good indicator that it's it's time to repot so again that doesn't mean that you can't find other ways to keep the tree healthy in that um, in that pot bound state but it just becomes a lot harder you know so I usually with my tropicals especially in development I do try to keep up with the maintenance, uh, the repotting maintenance, every two years usually is the interval. Um, so unless I have specific plans and I'm trying to uh, leave something pot bound for a reason. All right, Doug would like to know what soil mix would you suggest for a laurel oak when repotting? Um, I, I really like the course mix we use out here, especially starting out a, a tree's journey. I think the course mix tends to be the safest, um, and not even just our course mix, just a coarser mix tends to work really, really well. Um, deciduous trees do tend to like a little bit of moisture retention, um, so if you find that our course mix is too coarse or you live in an area that doesn't get the rainfall we get, you can always... Um, use a coarse mix that has a little bit of akadama in it or a river sand in it, something that's gonna hold a little bit of moisture. Um, but here, if I were to be collecting a laurel oak here in Florida and I needed a soil mix to put it in, I'd probably start with just our typical coarse mix and get it healthy and get it happy in that and work with it for uh, a few years in that mix before considering maybe uh, changing mixes. Adrian would like to know, are you repotting this from today? No, um, it's best to wait until, uh, I'd say probably May to do repottings on Premna. Um, they're just starting to wake up. Like they're literally just starting to grow. So I'd probably hold off. Uh, I like to repot these when they're really, really growing vigorously, especially if you're gonna do a, um, a potting from nursery soil to bonsai soil. Uh, that can be a little more aggressive of a project. So I would typically hold off um, until the tree is, has all the um, advantages working for it. So you kind of want to hold off until we're really, really warm and that tree can get uh, a lot of vigor to recover with. All right, Mike. Uh, Christopher wants to know if you have any experience with biotone, uh, in particular when repotting. If so, would you sprinkle it on the top to keep it away from the roots to start? I actually, unfortunately, don't have any experience with that product. Um, is it a, uh, is it like a, an organic fertilizer or a chemical fertilizer? It, if it is a chemical fertilizer, then yes, I would avoid placing it directly on top of the roots because it can burn roots. Any chemical fertilizer will. Uh, so just make sure that you're placing it with a good layer of soil between that and the roots, and you should be okay. Um, so I hope that helps, but no, I haven't had any experience with that specific product.
So what you'll find with these old Premnum branches is that they are can be pretty difficult to move. So what I've typically done on most of my Premnum in the past is I will work with what the tree has, but once it gives me new branches, a lot of these will be replaced by branches that I can kind of put better movement into, that I can feel a little more comfortable wiring and moving. Um, so these aren't these old branches aren't exactly the most desirable for heavy bends or twists and turns and things like that. So we're almost done. We're just working our way to the top part of the tree. Oh, um, Rick says he is now sifting old soil for future use. Do you recycle soil? And if so, what's your procedure? Um, I don't recycle soil. Um, the only element that I think you, you really could and is worth recycling is maybe the lava. Um, the rest would tend to break down. Maybe the shale would be okay. Um, but I, I haven't gotten into uh, reclaiming the soil yet. And from what I've heard, a lot of the guys who do do that are really just after the lava. Uh, so I'm not sure... Uh, I guess you would just essentially use the same sieves that you would use to kind of sift the soil in the first place um, and just kind of use it in reverse um, is my assumption, but uh, I'm, I don't have too much experience with that, unfortunately, right? Um, do you have a question for me? Uh, are we planning in doing more classes of different trees? Oh yeah. So um, here at Weigerts, we do try to teach um, a, a new schedule pretty much every quarter. So we do try to come out with at least classes that we haven't run uh, in the last quarter. We do try to keep it fresh and new, and we are always looking to um, create new classes. So, uh, yeah, we do offer a ton of different species classes. I know we've got some coming up. We've got an exposed root class with the Premnas coming up. Uh, and that's with these guys, teaching you how to grow them in the exposed root form, uh, also dealing with this material. Um, I believe we have a, uh, a Shohin Green Island class coming up. So we do focus a lot on specific species classes as well. And so feel free to come out and take one of those with us. And you can also look on our website and see uh, which classes are available, which one will be best for you specifically. I think that question was more, uh, are we planning on doing more classes like this one? They, oh. they came back for um, I think so, yeah. I mean, as long as this is going on, and, and probably even if it's not, I think as long as people enjoy this and there's, you know, a market for it, you guys are enjoying it and tuning in, then I think we'll, we'll continue to do it. You know, uh, just depends on what Eric and, and uh, Andrea want to do. And, and, uh, and, yeah, as long as you guys are enjoying it, we'll keep providing the content. Uh, how long did you leave the tree with exposed roots in the bottle? Uh, so this tree, you can actually, if you're following me on Instagram or on Facebook, you can go back and, and timestamp it and see when I started it. And it was June of last year. So we haven't even hit a year yet. So that's, uh, now the trick was I didn't prune this thing the entire time that I've been growing it in the bottle. I just pruned it for the first time last month and just took away a lot of the big growth. And the rest of it, I've just been allowing it to kind of run freely um, now, with that said, I have been going in and removing any branches that are growing on the inside of curves, any bar branches that are developing. So I do still need to eliminate problems, but then my good branches, especially since I'm trying to grow strong roots and things like that, I just want to let that run out so that I can grow these quickly. Um, all right, so this question has something to do with fungicide. Do, do you hold 
foliar spray and drench fungicide on your tropicals in Florida? Um, not typically. So I, I don't have a ton of issues with fungus, especially on Premna. Um, some trees I will use copper fungicide on, and uh, but I haven't seen the need to fully dunk them. Uh, the biggest need for a fungicide that I've had personally at my house is uh, conifers. So I get a ton of needle cast and uh, tip blights on junipers, and so I use daconil um, and I spray that on just as a spray. Um, but I'm not averse to dunking the trees. I just personally haven't had any uh, fungus outbreaks big enough to have to do it. Uh, here at the nursery, I do know that the guys uh, spray, and I don't think they use the uh, drench for the fungicide. I do know they're always spraying, so um, I'm not sh sure that they're doing the dunk with the fungicide uh, either. Now, we do use a drench for Tall Star to kill pests uh, for things that we're shipping or things that we absolutely have to get full coverage of the plant. See any other questions popping up there? That's all you got for now. We're good. So what you guys just saw me do was make a mistake on my wire, and I had to back it off and uh, and reapply it. So sometimes you might have to do that. Um, it's not my favorite thing to do, but what I had noticed was. While I was talking and not paying attention, I had crossed a couple wires to the back. Um, and aside from it looking unsightly, it can also impact my next wire that I'm gonna place on the tree. So it's something that I want to correct and, uh, and get rid of before I move on. Those of you guys who are maybe getting a little cabin fever, um, if you live in Florida, just so you know, we are open. Uh, you can come out, say hello, just from six feet away, and um, you know, take a walk around our gardens, get some fresh air. Says hello. Hello, what's up, Bernard? <laughs> Bernard's got some great buttonwoods. All right, Alex says I have an elm species that is pretty wild, and I'm at the point of pruning and shaping. Any specific tips or advice? So elms. Um Elms are one of those trees that some, some artists have criticized them for being a pain in the butt simply for the fact that they grow too fast. Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, and perhaps that's what you're getting at, is that it's growing very quickly and hard to keep up with, the best thing to do is, especially during the growing season, on a refined tree like this, is I go out at least once a week and I make sure that all of that growth that's growing out uh, is cut back to the silhouette and I don't let it run any further. Once I hit refinement to the point where I'm pruning consistently, I'm not typically looking to wire huge sections of the tree. I'm literally just looking for fine branching and I'm looking to either pinch the buds that come out or gently trim them as they start to emerge um, before they're allowed to elongate too far, okay? Um, so the same thing is with the elms, is you just gotta make sure that you check them and cut any branches that are growing too long. I usually, especially for Shohin, if it was a, a Chinese elm, I personally would go through and any branch that has grown um, maybe four or five leaf sets, I'll cut back to two leaf sets, hoping that I can pull two branches off of that remaining section. So I'm always, me personally, I'm always looking to increase my design uh, by two branches on every section of the tree. 
Um, we've got a question from Elena. Uh, okay. So you first use a different type of soil to grow the plant and then you transfer to a bonsai soil? Um, no, so you can, you can do that. So if you look, you'll see this is just regular gardening soil, just regular potting soil. Um, and this nine out of 10 people will just grow a tree in this temporarily until they're ready to train it and then they transfer it to a bonsai mix. Um, now, some of the more advanced techniques in Japan, Taiwan, um, and some of those countries talk about adjusting the mix based on the level of refinement of the tree. So you don't have to do that. There's been people who have been growing bonsai uh, in the same soil for 20 years um, and are perfectly happy with their trees. They have some great trees. Uh, it's just that if you are looking to kind of uh, follow along some of these newer Japanese techniques or you are trying to stay contemporary with some of these techniques, a lot of these guys from Japan are saying that they do adjust the soil based on the refinement of the tree. So if that's something that works for you, you can do that, but don't be afraid to, to then just grow it in a soil that works best for you, you know? Um, uh, something that I teach all the time in class is that bonsai can be as easy or as complicated as you want to make it but the results are, are going to be what comes out from your work so if you want bonsai to be very very easy um, that's fine you just can't have expectations for you know millions and millions of ramified branches things like that you know you just have to kind of pick and choose your battles and find your comfort zone mike do you have any experiment experience with growing trees in air pruning pots or pond baskets um yeah a little bit not a ton like that's that's a big technique for pines and conifers uh, but there's also a lot of uh, nurseries in japan that i've i've read about that have used that technique on all trees um, there's even a guy just recently that there was a big article of him growing in colander pots and he likes that method because he can stack the colanders on other pots um, I've never felt the need for it. We don't grow a ton of pines here in Florida, um, so I haven't done too much of that. Uh, the closest thing I do to colander growing that I could probably elaborate on is double pot growing. So what I do is as a tree gets uh, pot bound or if I'm trying to grow a tree in a small pot and let's say I'm in refinement already but I need to grow a branch and get it thicker, um, I might place a second pot underneath, allow this one to root into that one and give me a more robust root mass so that I can kind of power my design choices that I need to make, if that makes sense. Um, but as far as air pruning in the tropicals, I don't have a ton of experience with growing our tropicals in colanders and very limited experience um, with using colanders, uh, period, for training. So great technique though, it is a good technique. Um, Kristen would like to know, uh, how many times do you transplant from them? Uh, so you'll do it uh, forever. <laughs> you'll, you'll transplant them um, for the duration that they are bonsai, but you'll do it, once you get it into the pot you're happy with, you know, you, there are techniques in bonsai to keep it here. So now that I've got this tree in this pot, I won't realistically have to up pot this tree unless I wanted to. I can every year or every two years pull it out and root prune it and put it right back in this same pot. So I think where some of the confusion goes is that bigger pots help us grow and so you'll see that we're, we're growing them in different pots just to get different um, results. So the big pots are if we need to grow something big, a big branch, a big uh, more foliage, denser branching, a big pot helps power that quickly. Whereas a small pot is better for control, better for dwarfing, stunting, and kind of holding your, your work longer, if that makes sense. So, um, th so this is what the end result is gonna be. And when you get to that point, you're not gonna have to, to change it often and always have to buy new pots or anything like that. And Kristen again would like to know, uh how long have you been making bonsai? I've been making bonsai for 11 years now. Um, 11 years at the nursery. So I was lucky enough that when I, when I found bonsai or when I got into it, it also happened uh, right when I met Eric. So I kind of jumped in with both feet and, uh, and I had great, great, great instruction um, from day one. You know, so my bonsai journey has been, uh, it, it has been very rewarding. 
and has also been kind of accelerated because of my ability to work with him as quickly as I was when I first started out. So I've been doing this for about 11 years, uh, and uh, it's just one of those hobbies that uh, I'm always learning something new, and so it's really hard to get bored of. Now there's several different ways to style broadleaf trees. Um, well, let me rephrase that. There's two primary theories on how to style uh, bonsai uh, physiologically in the bonsai world. And you have basically conifer bonsai designs and you have broadleaf bonsai designs. Um, conifer is basically what you would think of like a pine juniper with descending branches hanging low uh, monopodial trunk where one trunk is dominant over the rest, uh, monopodial growth patterns with a liter per branch, um, and so that gives us that shelved kind of padded look that's so common in bonsai, uh, and that's a conifer feature. And then you have what a lot of people refer to as like deciduous or broadleaf structure. And that's kind of more up and out, uh, div a more equal division of energy, kind of like uh, one branch dividing to two, then to four, then to eight, then to 16, and so on and so forth. So it's more of a sympodial kind of even divide rather than just having one strong trunk. Um, so a lot of debate in bonsai goes to how to style trees and what's right and what's wrong. And that broadleaf trees should be styled as broadleaf trees and conifers should be styled as conifers. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to that rule. I had styled different trees differently based on um, the feeling that the tree invokes and me personally. Uh, Premna especially are one of those trees that can make really, really rewarding uh, conifer-esque designs with the pads. So it's a tree that I'm not afraid to kind of use in that method. Realistically, there's uh, thousands out here. Um, I, I don't have statistics to back this up, but I, I would argue that we're one of the biggest nurseries uh, that's actively growing here in the United States. Um, it is about seven acres out here, and most of it is used to grow and develop bonsai trees. Um, so you can imagine uh, the amount that we have here. Uh, so I would definitely guess uh, thousands upon thousands of trees. So. Uh, many different species, uh, hundreds of different species, I would guess, um, and all different shapes, styles, sizes um, that you can imagine. So one thing that, that I'm really proud of about our nursery here at Weigert's um, is that Eric has really cultivated a, uh, a world view of bonsai, if you will. So he hasn't subscribed necessarily to just the Japanese techniques or the Chinese techniques. He really does kind of see the beauty in each of the approaches to bonsai, each of the aesthetics, um, and caters to each of those. You know, we have trees that are imported uh, as Penjing from China. Uh, we have trees that are Japanese style or Japanese traditional species. Um, we carry a lot of traditional Japanese containers from Tokonome, as well as newer contemporary containers like Luba Skoda, uh, Roy Minerai. Uh, so. It, it is a very um, eclectic nursery and one that I really do think uh, gravitates towards just the love of bonsai as a whole. So I'm very, very happy to, to be a part of this. So I think we're pretty much done. Let me just make sure. So you can see we've basically got a triangular silhouette, which is what we were going for. I'm not looking to, to make any game-breaking changes today or have a definitive idea on how this tree is going to go. I'm merely trying to build structure today. Build good left, right, back, left, right, back. Um, some of these branches, if you are into deadwood, they might become gin as they get more character. Uh, me personally, I'd rather grow this into a very pretty multi-tiered padded design. Um, 
and so that's another good way to, to space the branches and another good reason to have good architecture on your tree. Um, this is also an area of concern that as it starts to bud back and as I maybe get some alternatives, I might pull more of this off of here and kind of pull branches from other areas. So I'd much rather have a branch coming from maybe here than having a, another branch clustered so tightly in here. And likewise, if I got a branch off of here, I could eliminate some of this mess in here. So it's really kind of a, a waiting game. Um, if this was my tree at home, I may just cut it all the way back to a line and be done with it uh, up in here and regrow all of it. So um, for now, I think this is, illustrates uh, the structure pretty well. And I think that, that will do for today. So for a couple last questions, yeah. can you stand behind the tree so it can be your background as Kathy pointed out, it makes a nice background for your tree so people can see the branching. Oh, oh look at that. Or, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, a couple last questions. Have you ever tried the drooping style for a Premna? I have not tried weeping style for Premna. So keep this in mind when selecting a style is that you don't want to select a style. Um, you don't want to select a tree that's going to work against your style every step of the way. Uh, you are free to do what you want and you could probably make a really cool weeping Premna, but the amount of upkeep that it's going to take uh, will probably drive you crazy and you probably will not enjoy the journey. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to take it that far, but um, this is one of those trees that might just fight you the whole time you're trying to make it a weeping slot. Okay, so really just stand up though. Okay. Okay, and then um, we have a couple questions real quick. What do I do with my hands? Uh, <laughs> point. Uh, so Adrian would like to know, when is the best time to repot a Japanese gardenia? I'm changing the, organic, um, changing the organic soil to bonsai soil. Should I remove all of its organic soil or should I leave some organic soil? So that's, a, that's tricky because I've done both. Um, you want to wait, the best time to do the gardenia, I'd argue, is probably later this month or May. So I've been doing mine in, in May the last few years and they've responded very, very well to that. Uh, we are in Florida though, so you could probably get away with doing them a little early. Uh, as far as the organic soil, uh, last year I did a bunch of these and I potted them over and left organic in some and bare rooted others. Uh, the only ones that are still alive through the winter were the ones that I bare rooted. Uh, what I did with the others was I left small organic cores, which benefited me short term. It meant that the tree stressed less uh, on potting. But then when we got into the winter months, watering became a big issue because I had that core of organic. And so it was always either too dry or too wet, too dry or too wet. So if you can, and you can get the feeder roots out of there uh, safely, then I would try to get as much of that organic out as possible. If not, then uh, you know it is what it is and just really try and nurse the tree uh, back through the winter months. So just like anything, there's a pro and a con to, to both choices. If you bear root, a little riskier but it'll be better long term if you don't bear root safer short term but might screw you long term so that's uh that's what i know all right cool um i think you also want to know uh how much roots can you cut back on the japanese gardenia are they sensitive they're you know i mean when they're when they're transferring from organic to bonsai soil the first potting they can be touchy so you definitely want to not try to fix all the roots and not try to cram it in the smallest spot you can. You literally, your primary goal needs to be this, transferring it from one soil to the other soil. And then following years, you can fix the roots afterwards. But I would say in my personal experience, the, the first potting from organic to bonsai soil is the most stressful for them. And so you need to get it through that with as many roots as possible. And then the next year or any year after that, it will be much easier to uh, prune the roots more vigorously. I mean, I've, I've been pretty aggressive on my gardenias uh, that are more refined and I haven't had any issues. So my only real concern is the initial, yeah, that is a little uh, sketchy. All right, that, that's good. Cool. Um, so, hey guys, thanks everybody for tuning in to Weigerts. Um, you know, follow us on Facebook, you follow us on Instagram. Also check out me at Mike Lane Show Him Studios on Instagram. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Stay safe out there and tune in next time. Have a good one, guys.